participants are in every all the participants have already been admitted yes yes okay good evening everybody it's a pleasure to welcome all of you at this uh, study circle meeting on a very intricate topic, uh, topic. so basically the entire interpretation of dt double a finally culminates in this article 23 where the actual uh, elimination of double taxation takes place because otherwise the taxing rights are allocated who can tax what and how much etc at what rate is there in the other articles but the real challenge or the real uh, benefit under the treaty i would not call it a challenge it is the benefit under the treaty is that when the tax uh, the resident country taxpayer gets credit for the taxes paid in the source country and there are several challenges associated with that both under the treaty as well as under the domestic law and we have got with us sushil lakhani who is a veteran uh, in international tax who has been a past uh, chairman of efa india so i will request uh, kush to introduce him first and then i will request uh, sushil to take over the proceedings thank you sir so as as uh, nilesh sir said i don't think in the international tax community we need to introduce sushil sir uh, but i still do so uh, sushil sir has uh, experience of more than 40 years in international taxation and he's a rank holder in not just inter but also final ca examinations uh, and as nilesh sir said he's been a past uh, past president of efa chairman of efa india and is currently on the executive committee of efa india as well uh, he has written several books including books on tds uh, on payments to non residents and foreign companies and a monogram on epc contracts and also a publication on expatriate taxation and he's an expert on uh, international taxation transfer pricing and uh, fema and i think there's no one better than him to take take us through this topic which is very challenging and interesting so sushil sir thank you so much uh, i'll hand over proceedings to you thanks uh, kush and uh, nilesh for your kind words of introduction uh, welcome to all the participants well the topic allotted to me today is foreign tax credit and related practical issues uh, you know it is in fact uh, to be very honest when i went deeper into this subject uh, basically with a view to prepare for today even i was uh, quite uh, amazed at the amount of controversies which are there you know the, some of the controversies i was aware of but most of them you know even came as a surprise to me that a topic which apparently looks so simple could have so many issues and so many interpretations by the courts so we are in for an interesting one and a half hour and i'll try to share whatever i read and whatever uh, i i am i hope at the end of the session the participants take away some useful uh, you know interpretations and uh, analysis with that uh, let me get to the so topic just one question uh, yeah. before uh... is that you would like to have the questions uh, at the at end, the end. i would prefer at the end because uh, you know there are uh, quite a few intricate issues which i feel we should cover mm -hmm. and i'm sure uh, i'll try and keep around 10 minutes plus at the end and uh, in case uh, you know if we fall short of time also i would not mind extending by another 5 or 10 minutes so so i would feel uh, you know so that we can get the entire flow of the topic and uh, all all questions i would be happy to answer at the end sure also just one also note to participants that we will share the presentation after the session so yeah. uh, in case that question was there yeah clarify. yeah yeah uh, right so with that i i think take up the topic now these friends are the relevant provisions which one is dealing with today Uh, in the income tax act there are three sections 90 90a and 91 of the act which deal with foreign tax credits there is a new section 89 capital a and a corresponding rule 21 triple a which deals with credits and taxation of amounts received by residents of india who were earlier residents of us or any other country on their retirement Uh, funds which they had invested there 
then we have rule 128 of the income tax rules which is basically the foreign credit ta foreign tax credit rules of india which were introduced somewhere in 2017 uh, along with that rule they introduced form 67 which one is required to file with the return of income to claim the credits now when you go to the treaty you have article 25 in most of the indian treaties and the model as nilesh said it's 23 in some of our treaty it is 24 some may have 26 that's not really important the title of that article is relief from double taxation which deals with foreign tax credits and then we have section 40 a small 2 read with explanation 1 2 and 3 uh, which again becomes relevant for the uh, topic that we are discussing so this is the gamut uh, which we have to cover today uh, these are the provisions this is just two. Now, uh, what I have done is first is the simple, you know, part of Rule 128 and Form 67 because this is our daily bread and butter, so to say, where you have to fill these forms, be aware of these rules, and uh, you know, have along with the return. So I thought we'll just complete that and then get to the real interpretation issues. Now, this is the Rule 128. Uh, which was introduced in 2017. Prior to that, of course, the courts were interpreting as to how the credits are to be granted in India. And then they came up with these elaborate rules. Of course, though they are elaborate, there are quite a few shortfalls, which also I will try to point out, or shortcomings rather. Now, uh, you know, these rules cover about mode of granting FTC. That is fine. Then the year of allowance of FTC is the year in which the income is going to be taxed, that foreign income. Then proportionate allowance, where corresponding income is offered to tax in more than one year, then it provides for proportionate credit. Then meaning of foreign tax, which is, uh, you know, what it says is basically the taxes which are covered under the DTAA or the taxes as defined in Section 91. Now, both of these are highly controversial, uh, the definition of foreign tax, so to say, the way the courts have interpreted. So I'll come to that separately but as far as the rules are concerned they allow taxes covered under the treaty where treaty is there and as far as where tra uh, treaties are not there then the taxes uh, as defined in section 91 then tax against which the ftc is available would be tax surcharge and cess under the act and this was also interpreted by supreme court when this rule was not there uh, exclusions for foreign tax credit you can't credit it against interest fee or penalty payable under the act. Now, as far as disputed foreign tax credit, let's say if you have a foreign tax credit, but you have taken it up in appeals in that foreign country, then you will not get credit here. You will get credit in the year in which the income is being offered to tax. If within six months from the end of the month of the final dispute settlement, the following are furnished. That is evidence of settlement evidence to the effect that liability for payment of tax has been discharged and an undertaking that no refund qua such amount has directly or indirectly been claimed in that country. So basically it is only after you pay the tax and the dispute is finally settled. Now finally settled would mean it has to be settled even if it is at the lower, let's say commissioner appeal type of a level, uh, you know, there should be no further appeal having been filed by you or, uh, you know, so it has to be a finality. You cannot claim a credit if there is still some dispute going on. Then mode of computing uh, is, uh, is to be, the amount is to be computed separately for each source of income and for each country, country-wise. So basically there was a decision before these rules in Bombay, Burma, Bombay High Court, which said that losses of one branch cannot be adjusted against profits of another branch for computing the foreign tax credit. And that is the case, like you have to compute it source-wise, country-wise. And the FTC shall be lower of tax payable under the act or the foreign tax paid on such income. This is what the rules say. Of course, the courts say something else and which we will be look, uh, looking in the next slide, in the subsequent slides. Now, foreign tax paid exceeding the amount of tax payable in accordance with the treaty is to be ignored. That means if you voluntarily ended up paying a higher tax in that foreign country, much more than what is the tax rate prescribed for the source country as per the treaty, then the credit will be limited to the treaty rates and not to the higher level. 
The foreign exchange conversion for FTC is also provided in the rule, so which is TT buying rate on the last day of the month, immediately preceding the month in which such tax was paid or deducted. FTC can be claimed even against MAT or AMT. And uh, as far as excess uh, FTC, after you claim for MAT or in case you have a loss, the rules clearly say that the excess cannot be carried forward. So as far as India is concerned, the excess FTC is lost. Documentation is provided. I'm not going to waste your time on that. And then you have, uh, it prescribes form 67, which it says that to be furnished on or before the due date under 139.1. Uh, thereafter, the CBDT has amended a rule to provide that form 67 can be furnished on or before the assessment year. On or before the last day, uh, on or before the assessment year where the return of income for such assessment year has been furnished. A refund of foreign tax credit, uh, Form 67 to be furnished. Now, this is an interesting aspect as far as foreign countries are concerned. They also allow carry backward of losses. We have only carry forward of losses. Some of these advanced countries have carry backward of losses. That means you have, let's say, income in a particular year. In the subsequent year, you make a loss then you could even carry back the loss and set it off against the earlier tax paid. So in such cases, the Form 67 requires you to furnish, uh, you know, wherever you claim a carry backward of losses in a refund in that country, then you are supposed to file in the form. There is a column which you are supposed to fill and inform. And so the FTC, which was given to you earlier, could be withdrawn. And this is the Form 67, uh, which is... Uh, there, I think I'm not going to dwell too much on this. Now, what are the issues with respect to this form? Now, you know, the question has come up whether belated filing of this form can affect my credit. And there are a number of decisions, including Mumbai Tribunal, recent decision of Sonakshi Sinha and uh, Bangalore, et cetera, which said that it doesn't really matter. The, the same form 67, if it was not filed in time, can be filed later on. In fact, even uh, at the uh, even if the return was processed or time for revision has been ex has expired, uh, the court has allowed the credit to be given after verification. Then for computing, of course, the rule now clearly provides uh, the surcharge and education cesses to be included for the credit. How to allocate expenses, like you have foreign income and uh, you may have expenses there and you may have some expenses in India also, let's say. So how to allocate expense and compute the doubly taxed income. For this, an interesting decision is Elite Core Technologies of Ahmedabad, which discusses in detail how to compute income from that particular source for purposes of computing the tax on which credit can be claimed. So this is an interesting decision, which may be usefully referred. Rule 128 is silent about underlying credit. As you know, treaties have a concept. Uh, as far as India is concerned, there are only two treaties where you will get underlying credit as far as India is concerned, that is Mauritius and Singapore. And the treaty, the rule is silent about how to claim those. It's also silent about US state taxes, you know, in some countries, especially let's say USA. Uh, states also refer uh, uh, devi and income tax in addition to the federal income tax. And the question has always been whether the US state taxes could be also claimed uh, as a credit. The rule is silent on that. And uh, the way it is drafted indicates that it will be only the taxes covered by the treaty, which is basically the federal tax. Tax payable in the word used in the rule uh, you know, this has been, as I already pointed out, there is a lot of controversy in, on this subject and which we are going to deal in detail. Uh, then the tax payable under the Act is to be computed after giving effect to all items of brought forward losses deductions, which causes practical difficulties when we really uh, have a complex case on hand. And an entity which is regarded as a separate legal entity in one country, because in most of these countries, uh, you know, you may have partnership firms which may be uh, transparent, or you may have pass-through entities in the form of funds, etc. And so the income is taxed in the hand of the individuals or the partners. 
So in such scenario, there could be some complications. Also, there are certain uh, countries with which India has signed limited tax treaties. So the rules don't seem to be covering those uh, type of treaties. Then, uh, you know, there is also a decision which says FTC is allowable even if no return was, uh, even if no claim was made in the return or during the assessment proceedings. This was IBM's case in Bangalore. And then the question also arises whether this rule can go, it goes much beyond the provisions of the treaty because uh, it uh, the section which gave these uh, power to make these rules uh, empowers the government to lay down the procedure for granting of the relief or deduction, even under section 90, which is where India has signed a treaty. And so the question arises whether, uh, you know, if suppose the treaty allows full tax credit, can this rule restrict it to ordinary tax credit? That's the way the rule is worded. Does the rule override the treaty to that extent? And I, in my view, no. But anyway, that issue is alive. And if DTA provides for tax pairing, for example, can rule 128 restrict it? Uh, it seems to, but again, the treaty should override it. And uh, the applicability of these rules to pending assessments would also become an issue. So this friends, uh, very briefly and very quickly was something on the FTC rules. And now let's come to the real meat or the law on the subject. And that is where the fun lies. Now, in this segment of my presentation, I am trying to cover the section, the two sections in the act, that is section 90 and section 91, and the issues connected with them, as also whether there is an interplay between these two or are they totally mutually exclusive? And so, so with that, uh, now I'm, you know, this is an overview of section 90 and 91. So section 91 I have kept on the left side, though technically, chronologically, it should be the other way around, but there is a reason for that. Now, 91 is a section which deals with the unilateral credit. That means where treaties is, there is no existing treaty of India with that country. And there is a general provision that India will allow credit uh, even in absence of treaties. So section 91, basically is a general provision for grant of tax relief, irrespective of whether the provisions of the other country, when I say state, it means country, as you all know, provides for tax relief. It is also applicable where the DTA does not exist. Now, the question I put after that, uh, you know, does it, can it be extended to even situations where there is a DTAA? And there is a court decision, a high court decision to that effect which has discussed this in detail and allowed it. So that we will come to. So technically, if you read the section, it's very clear. It should not, uh, if you read section 90 along with 91, it would be clear that 91 would not generally apply where there is no treaty. However, this issue has arisen and been held in favor of this. See? Then tax credit under section 91, is available in respect of doubly taxed income. This is the words used in the act, except for income which is deemed to accrue or arise in India. Now this is important. Uh, under 91, you can claim credit for all taxes paid in the other country, even if there is no treaty. The only condition is that the, that income on which uh, the tax is being paid uh, should not have deemed to accrue or arise in India. As you know, section nine covers the situations where income is deemed to accrue or arise in India. There are uh, eight sublims to that section, each dealing with a different category of income and providing the source rule. So basically those incomes do not accrue or arise in India. However, by a deeming fiction, they are deemed to have accrued or arisen in India. So if the credit you want, then the only condition in section 91 is it should not be falling into any of those sublims of section nine. And if it is otherwise uh, doubly taxed, then you will get a credit. Then uh, the country of residence, uh, you know, in FTC basically is the country of residence, which is allowing credit for the taxes paid in country of source uh, on the ordinary credit method. Now, as you know, 
you know i could have possibly you know fashioned this presentation explaining to you what is the different methods of credit ordinary method and uh, full credit method then exemption method exemption with progression method but i am i am assuming that the audience here is aware of these i'm presuming that and uh, people who are not aware may please take a little effort and read this is theoretical and so because in the interest of time i thought it would be more useful to cover the issues rather than getting into the theory of the subject but in simple words section 90 basic 91 basically talks about ordinary credit method which means the credit for the tax cannot exceed the tax imposed in the country of residence on the foreign income so that's ordinary method full credit in other words would mean that you will get full credit for the tax paid outside india even if there is no tax being paid in india but so it goes by the ordinary method that section 91 and the most important part of section 91 is the definition of the word tax now here you may please take a note section 91 the way tax is defined as you know even section 2 uh, defines tax i think 2 bracket 43 but the way tax is defined in section 91 is extremely wide it includes any excess profit tax or business profit tax charged on the profits by the government of that country or any part of that country or any local authority of that country so so when you are claiming credit under section 91 the word tax is very wide under section 91 state taxes even local authority taxes could get covered even sometimes a church tax could get covered if it is a tax on business profits so if it is a tax it should not be a tax calculated with reference to business profit but it should be a tax on business profits and that could be claimed as a credit under section 91 so 91 is extremely wide and the only uh, negative is that the income should not have been of the nature covered in section 9 of our income tax act beyond that uh, you know not only the nature it should not have been sourced in india under section 9 of that act so this is section 91 now when you go to the right hand side of the slide that is section 90 which is bilateral relief that is where dtwa has been entered into by india this is applicable where there is a dtwa and uh, you know courts have held it to permit credit and technically in this 90 the credit is to be limited to the extent of tax provided in the treaty but the court has allowed uh, credit even for taxes which are not covered in the treaty and that is something interesting which we will see in our subsequent slides because dtwa is define uh, the taxes covered and makes very clear and generally the federal taxes except in case of germany where trade tax is covered but generally it is the federal income tax as we know is covered however uh, and the section also seems to indicate that that is only the taxes for which credit would be given however the courts have held otherwise then when you come to yeah more very important aspect of section 90 is the interpretation of section 90 bracket 1 bracket small a bracket small 2 now which means uh, which was inserted in 2004 by way of an amendment section 90 basically says empowers the central government to enter into treaties uh, to give relief on incomes which are subject to tax in both countries to avoid uh, to give relief in such cases and it also provides in this subsection 2 even if income is chargeable to tax in both the states so it just gives the powers to the central government to enter into treaties to cover such situations the way this particular clause has been inserted uh, has been interpreted by the courts is extremely interesting and we will look into that then uh, indian treaties generally have the ordinary credit method there are a few treaties which to my mind uh, you know there are few treaties which clearly have full credit method this one example nambia and namibia which uh, has full credit method but uh, you know us or uh, germany or you know most of these treaties uh, they have uh, ordinary credit but the courts have interpreted these treaties 
to mean full credit again that's an interesting issue which we will be seeing how and how what was the logic or the way they interpreted it and uh, there are only i believe around four treaties which have the exemption method that means the income will be taxed only in the source state and the resident country will exempt it so that's i'm pointed out and there are 56 treaties which india has signed which provide for tax sparing credit tax sparing credit would mean that even if that country uh, does not tax an income because of certain economic or uh, you know reasons uh, gives an incentive for example still india while giving credit would assume that tax was paid on those and give credit for that so 56 of our treaties have such tax sparing credit which again is an important aspect which we will be discussing in our slides uh, treaties uh, as i already pointed out list out the taxes covered for relief and the article 23 whatever the number which deals with double tax relief would govern the extent of such credit right and the, another important point is that generally the way these articles are worded in the treaties they are worded to make it subject to domestic law so so again what is the meaning of those does 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 it mean that uh, you know rule 128 for example uh, is is it domestic law and can the treaties be set this article be said to be subject to rule 128 or is the rule not really the law it is the section which is the law and so so one has to look into that aspect also so uh, this uh, friends was a brief overview of these two sections uh, the next is you know if we go through the wordings of section 91 because this is the crux of the entire uh, you know issue of foreign tax credit in india the wordings of these two sections and the way the courts have really interpreted them so i'm dwelling a little longer on this uh, just to make that point clear so what section 91 basically says the title is very clear countries with which no agreement exists so if any person who is resident in india proves that in respect of income which accrued or arose outside india and which is not deemed to accrue or arise in india he has paid in any country which which there is no agreement under section 90 income tax and he shall be entitled to reduction from indian tax payable by him of a sum calculated on such doubly taxed income at the indian rate or or the or the rate of tax of the said country whichever is lower as i said the ordinary credit method or at the indian rate of tax if both the rates are equal so this is the wordings of section 91 i am taking 91 first as i explained for a reason and uh, in this definitions in section 91 the most important definition is income tax which i already dwelt upon the expression income tax includes any excess profit tax or, or business profit tax charged on the profits by the government of any part of that country or a local authority in that country which means even the state government whatever it charges or even the local authority whatever it charges in that country so long as it is a tax on the business profits or the excess profit tax charged on the profits then it would be creditable under section 91 now the one or two decisions uh, one or two issues more on 91 uh, an issue had arisen before the court whether the term paid uh, entails actual payment by that foreign entity or in that foreign country let's say they withheld tax uh, under their law and should they have paid in the same year in the year of taxability in india and the the courts have held that the paid uh, just means actually paid according to the method of accounting so even if they had made a provision and paid it subsequently the credit should not be lost though of course as i would again point out rule 128 and these decisions are prior to the rule rule 128 seema seems to mandate that there has to be a payment but then you know in a case where you may fall foul then possibly these decisions could be relied upon then another interesting issue came up in section 91 is when you are computing doubly taxed income whether deduction weighted deduction under 35b in those years or ATHHB which was a deduction for exports etc is to be taken into account for computing the doubly taxed income 
like have you to reduce them for computing the double tax income or do you have to ignore them and the court said you can ignore them because the way uh, you know and this was in uh, Crompton and it was also followed by the Bombay High Court in Reliance Infrastructure so there is a Madras High Court judgment and a Bombay High Court judgment which have both held that under section 91 when you are computing doubly taxed income that is when you are in a situation where there is no treaty and you are applying section 91 the words used are doubly taxed income and the interpretation given is that the unilateral relief granted under 91 is on doubly taxed income which means that part of the income which is actually included in the SSC's total income here they said the word income as is understood in 91 would be the income as computed in the normal sense before adjustment of the deduction under 35b or even 80 hhb what is contemplated by the expression income is not an exact quantum or measure of income as computed either in india or abroad but income as ordinarily understood in a commercial business sense this is so because the Indian tax law may, be, may not be identical to the laws obtaining in the other country. So with this logic, in both of these judgments, or both of high courts, one is Madras, one is Bombay, they have held that uh, you know, while computing the credit, you can ignore these deductions and give a higher credit, so to say. Uh, of course, you may also note that when the similar issue came up, before Andhra Pradesh High Court and Rajasthan High Court in respect of AT RRA deduction, they held against. They have taken a different view. So we have two high courts which have taken a view, a particular view. Bombay, of course, being a jurisdictional high court when we are speaking in Mumbai, uh, Reliance Infrastructure has taken a favorable view of the matter. So, so very interesting to me because uh, you know the way i could have interpreted doubly taxed income would mean only what is finally taxed but uh, the courts have taken a totally different interpretation of it. then another issue on 91 is whether resident but not ordinary resident is also entitled to claim relief under 91 the courts have said yes in aditya khanna's case and they they have held in favor then the word income used in 91 also came up before the coast, whether it means gross income or net income. Because there are a few decisions, one of Rajasthan and one, I believe, of some tribunal, which had taken the view that it is only the income which is paid, that is after TDS or after the withholding tax, and you did not gross it up. In these decisions, the courts have held, no, it means the net income, uh, you know, uh, that is one, and the like after all expenses. Basically, it should be net income, uh, which has to be taken into account and not the gross foreign income, right? So this uh, was an overview of 91 with some issues. Now we just quickly uh, try and see what 90 has to say. Uh, Section 90, as I already explained, is applicable where DTAA exists. So if you have foreign income coming from a country where there is a treaty, then Section 90 is the section which uh, grants the relief. And what does this say? Uh, it says central government may enter into an agreement with the government of any country outside India for the granting of relief in respect of income on, on which have been paid income tax under both the countries or income tax chargeable under this act and under the corresponding law in force, right? To promote mutual now this two subclause two was introduced as i said in 2004 and uh, this basically the way it is worded it just empowers the government to enter into a treaty for this purpose however interestingly the courts have uh, held you know that the word income tax chargeable because the you have to distinguish between one and two one basically covers where tax has been paid in both the countries and they said income tax chargeable under the act which means though, though the tax is not paid in either of the two countries it could be the source country or even the resident country still credit would be available even in respect of those taxes so so this is the point which i'm now what i have done is i've tried to cover the case laws under three subcategories 
to understand section 91A small 2. The first category is foreign tax credit in the 90 in cases where income is exempt or deductible in the source country, that is the host country. Now, this uh, friends is covered in the treaties where there is a tax pairing clause. Now this uh, you know credit would be available in treaties where we have, and as I said, we have 56 treaties which have a tax pairing credit. I've just put out three or four illustrations, Bangladesh, China, Cyprus, Kazakhstan, Italy, there are quite a few others which basically say that the tax paid in the contracting state in para one and two, now that means either of the contracting states shall be deemed to include the tax which would have been payable, but for the legal provisions concerning tax reduction exemption, like we have section 10A, SEZ benefits or whatever, you know, some certain types of deductions under chapter 6A for a promotion of economic development. So they say those taxes though you do not pay in that country wherever the treaty provides for a tax pairing you would assume the taxes were paid and credit can be claimed in india so these are the type of treaties where credit can be claimed uh, where you know it is deductible or exempt in the other country and uh, you know the variants of tax pairing in indian treaties that is there could be a tax pairing with respect to general tax incentives uh, I have given examples of, uh, you know, Oman, then tax pairing without reference to any specific tax. It's a general clause without mentioning any specific provision or of that country, Bulgaria and China. Then there could be tax pairing with reference to specified provisions of their law, which is Australia, Belgium, Canada, and only in respect of specified incomes is Spain. I've just given some illustrations. Now, in case of Oman, in fact, there is a decision against which the SLP has been admitted in the Supreme Court uh, is in Delhi High Court decision of Krishak Bharti, where though on the dividends, there were no taxes paid in Oman, credit was claimed in India on the basis that there is a tax bearing clause in the treaty and the Delhi High Court allowed it. There is a uh, SLP which has been admitted in the Supreme Court and is pending. There are other decisions which I've also mentioned there, Polyplex, Chemwell, Stride Pharma, et cetera, where uh, tax bearing credits have been permitted. So, so in cases where there is a tax bearing clause in the treaty, and this can be kept in mind. So when you're applying foreign tax credits, please look into the specific treaty. And if there is a tax bearing clause, then you could claim the credit. Then a question had also arisen whether the SSC who is claiming the credit is supposed to demonstrate that a particular exemption in that country, in the foreign country was with the view to promote economic development. And the court said there is nothing to be demonstrated. Once there is a, a the benefit there and there is a tax bearing clause, you will get the credit. So that was the first category. The second category is foreign tax credit when foreign income is exempt or deductible in the resident country, the country in which you are claiming credit. And for the purpose of our discussion today, we are taking India as the resident country because uh, credits are always to be provided by the resident country. So now this is an interesting situation that can you claim credit? Uh, so the situation I'm talking about is a situation where the income has been taxed in the foreign country fully and let's say in the in india that income is exempt from tax can i still claim credit because the principle general principle is that you can claim credit only if income is taxed in india and only to that extent however the question you know has arisen before the courts and not smaller courts right up to the high court uh, and a matter is pending even in the supreme court where whether foreign income tax credit can be claimed for when income is foreign income is exempt or deductible under the domestic law of India. So now I am just giving you uh, on this slide a comparative of two treaties, uh, the wordings. The issue here was, uh, you know, in this is a famous case of Wipro under uh, Karnataka High Court, which held in favor of the SSC where Wipro had income from branches in US, Canada, and number of countries. And in India, 
that income was exempt under 10 capital A. Wipro said that we would still be entitled to credit for the taxes paid in those countries, despite the exemption, because the ex under the exemption, there was no tax payable in India on that income. But they claimed full credit for the taxes paid in those countries. And the court had occasion. It's a very interesting decision, very controversial decision, honestly, uh, with due respect to the Honorable Court. And uh, the matter, this uh, decision has also been appealed in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has admitted an SLP against it, which is pending as of today. Now, let's look at the wordings which the court examined. The India-US Treaty basically says is that you will get a credit to the extent, like uh, the way the court interpreted the US Treaty is that credit under the US treaty is available to the extent of tax paid in USA. There is no condition in the US-India treaty to say that the tax has to be limited or has to be referring to any Indian tax paid. And this is the wordings on the basis of which the court, uh, Karnataka High Court in Wipro uh, came to this finding. I honestly find it difficult to accept, but the wordings are right before you. The first limb of the uh, say that particular article says, where a resident of India derives income, which in accordance with the provisions of this convention may be taxed in the United States, India shall allow as a deduction from the tax on the income of that resident an amount equal to income tax paid in USA. If, if it was ending year, then there was no issue at all, because this is very clear that uh, whatever tax has been paid in USA, you will get a credit in India. However, the, it doesn't end there because there is a second para to this article, which says such deduction, however, shall not exceed that part of the income tax as computed before this deduction, which is attributable to the income which may be taxed in the United States. So, so the way I read it is that this deduction should not exceed that part of the income tax being levied in India, which is attributable to the income which may be taxed in the United States. That's the way I was reading it. However, the court has read it in a different way. The court says this also refers to the tax payable in United States and nothing to do with India. So they said in the India-US treaty, and there are quite a few other treaties like Germany, and France, and Netherlands and have similar wordings. And they said in all these treaties, uh, you will get credit for the tax paid in those countries, even if there was no tax payable in India on that source. Very interesting, uh, you know, but being a high court uh, decision uh, with, a, with a detailed discussion on the topic, it's an extremely academic and extremely interesting point which has arisen. Uh, so, so this is the way they interpreted India-US. Now, when they came to India-Canada in the same judgment, they say this uh, treaty and treaties similar to this are very clear in their wordings. They clearly restrict the tax only to the tax payable in India. And that's how they contradistinguished these two treaties. Because here in the Canadian treaty, it says the amount of Canadian tax paid, uh, you know, in respect of income from sources within Canada, which has been subjected to tax both in India and Canada, shall be allowed as a credit against the Indian tax payable in respect of such income, but in an amount not exceeding that proportion of Indian tax, which such income bears to the entire income chargeable to Indian tax. So they said this is very clear, and here your credit will be limited only to the extent of Indian tax. So this was the decision in the case of Wipro. And Tata Consultancy Mumbai Tribunal followed the decision. It also followed this decision for Denmark Treaty, Norway Treaty, Oman Treaty, Saudi Arabia, Taiwan, all of them having similar words to US. And except India, Canada, India, Finland, they had those words which were similar and there the treaties, uh, there these decisions restricted the credit. Now, so far so good, there was a high court judgment. However, uh, you know, I would uh, invite your attention to two uh, interesting judgments actually. Uh, one in Bank of India's case, which is 2021, so much later, 
after the Wipro's decision was 2015. Well, this is a tribunal decision of 2021, Bank of India case, Mumbai Tribunal, where uh, our respected Sri Pramod Kumar, he has authored the judgment and an excellent judgment for any student of international tax who is interested in this subject. And he has uh, disagreed with the Wipro decision. He, he has given detailed reasoning and uh, he said that this decision does not seem to be correct to his mind. And he, of course, said that, uh, you know, it is not binding in Bombay, Wipro being a Karnataka High Court decision. And so he has distinguished the judgment and did not apply it. So he, he was of the clear view that even under the India-US treaty, the credit would be available only to the extent of tax paid in India and not otherwise. And he has discussed at length the entire international tax jurisprudence very nicely, very in a very uh, analytical and a masterly manner. And, uh, you know, he has come to the conclusion that this decision seems to be uh, not correctly uh, worded. So, so this, uh, friends, is the controversy as far as Wipro is concerned and as far as the uh, interpretation of the India, US and those type of treaties are concerned as far as credits go. Now, the third category, which I said is foreign tax credit in case of a loss return in the resident country. So let's say you have a not an exempt income, but you have losses in the resident country. So you had incomes in the foreign branches. However, you had on an overall basis, the resident country, there is a loss return. Can we claim credit in such cases in respect of the foreign tax? And this issue arose again before Sri Pramod Kumar in the case of Bank of India, which is another judgment where, uh, you know, he again uh, was, it's a very detailed judgment where he has discussed this point And of course he rejected it. He said the law in India, of course, does not provide for such uh, uh, credits uh, because the law is clear that only if to the extent of Indian tax payable and there is no provision for carry forward of foreign tax credits. However, the argument of Bank of India was interesting. What they said was that uh, when there are losses in India, so to that extent, I'm, you know, uh, the foreign income is being taxed in India because my losses carry forward is getting reduced because I'm setting off those losses. So in future, you know, I'll be paying tax which I should have, you know, so I should get credit in future whenever you tax me because you have reduced my losses to that extent. And there, Mr. Pramod Kumar has mentioned very clearly that uh, though the present, the way the rule is worded, uh, it does not seem to allow any carry forward of credits. However, this issue cannot be said to be closed and this argument would be possibly taken in future as in when there is a tax payable by Bank of India and they could possibly still raise this issue in future. So which, which uh, you know, because he said in most of the countries, there would be a carry forward in such situation. The India does not provide a carry forward, uh, you know, in a specific manner, but surely the courts can look into that aspect at that time, right? So, so this was another interesting judgment, which needs to be looked at. So Bank of India's decision and the Wipro's decision, these are two, must read for anybody really uh, wanting to study the subject of foreign tax credits from an Indian perspective is my view. And of course, the third judgment, I'm going to come up with, with the Reliance Infrastructure Decision of Bombay High Court. So these three decisions actually, uh, you know, if you really go through them and, uh, you know, most of the uh, doubts or issues which arise will be there. So this uh, was on section 90 and 91, an overview. Now let's see whether there is a possibility to claim credit for taxes. You know, is, let's say you are uh, dealing with a treaty country. And as I said, section 90 is the one and you know, that would govern you. But is there a possibility that in those cases also you could try to claim credit for state taxes, even under 90. Is there any way to do it? Because as I said, 91 clearly allows it. Now whether 90 can be stretched to allow it is the next issue that I'm taking up. So here again uh, comes Wipro. 
the same decision of Andhra Pradesh, uh, Karnataka High Court. This again was a question before uh, the court that uh, you know the credit should be allowed uh, even in respect of U.S. state taxes. So what the SSC argued was that under 91, uh, you know, I am going to get all the credits. However, 91, I can uh, uh, approach only if there is no double tax treaty. While in this case, I have a treaty with US and I have paid state taxes. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm being, and I'm, uh, section 90 also allows me to select whichever is more favorable. You know, I can be governed by the act or the, uh, or the treaty, whichever is more favorable to me. In this particular case, the act seems to be more favorable to me. Why am I being thrust with 90? Why should I not claim credit under 91? And the court said that uh, they, they found another way of giving that relief uh, in Wipro. They said that India has not entered into an agreement with the state of USA, any states of USA. It has entered into an agreement with the United States of America, but not with any specific state. So, and, and uh, 91 basically says that where there is no agreement entered into, uh, you know, then any taxes by any part of that country also could be claimed. So, so they said, because of that, is in respect of those taxes, where I have not entered into an agreement with the, any particular state of USA, I can give relief under 91. And they gave relief for the US state taxes. So foreign tax credit was allowed to a case where treaty existed, uh, by the Karnataka High Court in Wipro. Now, then came Ahmedabad Tribunal, uh, and I'm a fan of Mr. Pramod Kumar, to be very honest. And so this case of Rajiv Modi has agreed with the Karnataka High Court, and but they found a different way of agreeing. They, they said that, uh, you know, 90 or 90, I'm, I'm entitled to claim, uh, you know, under the act, whatever is more favorable to me. 91 is allowing me credit for state taxes. 90 does not seem to allow me and which does not seem to be right. It is not as per the spirit of the act. And so I am. we are going to allow this credit for state taxes in this case. So Rajiv Modi's case, they also allowed credit for the US state taxes, even in a case where there is a treaty. So these are the two very interesting decisions on this aspect. Then the, the only thing to be kept in mind is that if you claim 91, you know, US state taxes, the you have to remember that credit can only be in respect of doubly taxed income. So, so you know, uh, that is uh, uh, something where you will not get, then be able to go to the treaty and claim tax bearing and all of those things. So you have to be careful when you compute. And, uh, uh, you know, you cannot claim credit under 91 in respect of incomes which are deeming to accrue or arise in India. So they should not be falling within section nine, uh, those type of incomes. So beyond that, it seems to suggest that with these two judgments that you almost have an option, even if there is a treaty to select 90 or 91. Of course, this is not the last word on the subject, I'm sure. Uh, there's a lot more because as I said, Wipro is before the Supreme Court. So let's wait and watch. But very interesting aspects. Um, the other decisions on the same point, Tata Sons also allowed state taxes, Aditya Khanna allowed. And there is one decision against of Delhi Tribunal, which is Manpreet Singh Gambhir, where US state taxes credits were not allowed. So this uh, was the interplay of 90 and 91. Now we come to some more interesting issues, uh, you know, having understood 90 and 91, and I hope I'm clear and people are finding this interesting. Some very interesting other issues let's go to. Uh, here came a uh, issue whether if I'm not getting credit, either under 90 or under 91, if credit is not being given to me for whatever reason, under 91, I will not get credit on the ground that income is deeming to accrue or arise in India. And so 91 credit may not be given. Otherwise, 90, 91, of course, allows credit for state taxes, etc. In 90, I will not get credit because the tax 
is not of the nature covered in the treaty. So in those situations, can I claim deduction under section 37 bracket one for those taxes? So they are income tax paid to the state, let's say in, in USA is one example, and I'm not getting credit for whatever reasons then can I claim deduction under section 37 bracket one? And this came up before the Bombay High Court in the case of Reliance Infrastructure. And the Bombay High Court held in favor of the SSC that such taxes, you could claim credit, uh, you could claim deduction under section 37.1. But again, uh, Mr. Pramod Kumar's decision in case of elite core technology, attaxman.com, Ahmedabad Tribunal, which again does not agree with Bombay High Court judgment and being in Gujarat, Ahmedabad Tribunal being in Gujarat jurisdiction did not follow uh, Reliance Infrastructure. Uh, he of course followed Reliance Infrastructure when he was sitting in a Mumbai bench on the, with, by saying that I'm bound by that decision, it being a jurisdictional High Court decision. However, very interesting uh, decision, elite core technology, which distinguishes or does not agree with Bombay High Court, and I'll explain quickly why. Now, to understand this uh, controversy, one has to understand uh, the scheme of section 40A bracket two, small two, which basically prohibits deduction under as an expense of any amount or any sum paid on account of any rate or tax levied on profits on gains of any business or profession or assessed at a proportion of such profits, right? So this is 40A small two, which basically denies deduction of income tax or any tax in the nature of income tax. Then there is an explanation which was added in this 40A small two. It says for the removal of doubts, it is declared for the purposes of this sub clause any sum paid on account of uh, tax levied includes and shall be deemed to have always included a sums eligible for relief under 90 or under 91. So this is the section which we have to cross before we can get a deduction under section 37 bracket one. To say that, okay, first we have to cross this threshold and then we could claim 37 one. Now, when the, uh, issue came up before the court uh, in uh, Reliance Infrastructure. The way it was, uh, you know, held by the court and argued uh, was that the explanation one basically restricts this uh, denial of deduction only to taxes which are covered. Firstly, only to income tax as defined under the Income Tax Act. And secondly, only to the taxes which are covered under the treaty or taxes which are uh, you know, covered under section 91, nothing else. So, so if there is a situation where a tax, like for example, US state tax is not covered under the treaty as a tax for which credit will be given, then in those situations, section 40A small two does not apply. That was the line of argument taken and upheld by the court uh, in Reliance Infrastructure. They, they said that after this explanation, if you don't read the explanation, then any income tax could not have been ever claimed. But they say the explanation seems to restrict the section, the 40A2, to say that it is only to that extent that the section has to be uh, read in. Now, this interpretation uh, was, uh, you know, an, in the contrary decision of elite core technology, Mr. Pramod Kumar again has said, uh, and I, I again, with uh, due respect to the Honorable Bombay High Court, I tend to agree with his uh, analysis, which he has basically said that the explanation cannot widen the section or restrict the section. The explanation is only giving some meaning or some additional meaning, but the basic section 40A2 basically says that no deduction will be allowed for any rate or tax. Again, he has also harped on the word rate. He says it's not only tax, it is also rate or tax levied on profits and gains, etc. And he, he has said that 
you know, the interpretation of the Bombay High Court to say that it is to be restricted only to the uh, ta income tax or tax covered under the treaty or tax covered under Section 91, etc. He does not agree with that. And in the case of Elite Corps, and he has relied on another uh, Bombay High Court old judgment of Lubrizol, which was for surtax and which was approved by Honorable Supreme Court. Uh, that was uh, the decision he relied on as taking a correct view of the matter. And he has, uh, being in Ahmedabad, as I said, he said, this is not a jurisdictional high court. Uh, that was Bombay High Court. This is in Gujarat, and I'm not agreeing to that. So that is on 37.1. But uh, otherwise, as of today, you know, there are a number of decisions which have come, which have allowed state taxes after Reliance Infrastructure. Being in a jurisdictional high court in Bombay, Clearly, this is allowable, uh, and uh, you know this is binding till. And this, of course, is not pending before the Supreme Court. At least to my research, I could not find that this decision uh, there is any SLP pending. Maybe I am wrong, but whatever research I carried out, I could not get any thing to that effect. So as of today, sitting in Bombay, U.S. state taxes can be claimed uh, as a deduction under 37.1, even if one assumes that Wipro is incorrect and maybe the Supreme Court might reverse it, then uh, you know you could claim 37.1 for sure, as till, till this decision holds the ground. Then another interesting issue came up before the courts is whether full credit is allowable under India-US treaty and alike treaties, or is it limited to ordinary credit? I think I already covered it in Wipro that you know the way they interpreted the India-US treaty, they said that full credit would be allowed. In the sense, even if there is no tax payable in India, credit would be allowable. Again, as I said, uh, seems to be an incorrect decision. I refer to Bombay, Bank of India's Bombay Tribunal decision which has taken a different view of the matter and given a detailed uh, explanation why they do not agree with the Wipro decision and did not apply it. Uh, and so this issue is really alive. The uh, matter is pending before the Supreme Court. So the way the US treaty and all those line of treaties are being interpreted as allowing full credit. Uh, so which means despite no tax or lesser tax being payable in India, still a credit uh, being given for the taxes paid in USA, uh, which Wipro allowed, uh, is another issue. Then the other, the next issue which we can take up uh, is uh, on the characterization of income. Now, when uh, you know it uh, routinely happens that the way the source country may characterize a particular income in their country as per their law may not be the way the resident country may characterize it. It could be, for example, India characterizes incomes in the form of royalty, FTS, while the resident country may treat it as business income. And that happens even when an Indian recipient is there. So when the character or somebody may characterize, some law may characterize something as a capital gain or as an income from other sources, for example, while the other country may have a different characterization of such income under their laws. So does the treaty benefit get curtailed in any manner because of different characterizations uh, in the source country and the resident country? This again came up before the Calcutta Tribunal in Somdat Builders. It was held in favor of the SSC. That, and again, there is an old uh, Supreme Court judgment in case of, I think, Ramaswamy Chetyar, which also has held that it is not necessary that they should characterize in the same manner. The only prerequisite is that the same income, the income should relate to the same person and should be taxed in that same year. Uh, you know, that is the only two requisites. It is not, the characterization really doesn't matter. Then uh, another issue came up was on, can foreign tax credit be denied on shifting of tax residency? Now here what happens is, X is an employee who seeks voluntary retirement while, while serving for a company in the state A, and he comes back and becomes a resident of India. State A can claim that VRS compensation paid to X is sourced in state A as it related to employment in state A. So when he is now become a resident of the other country, can the FTC be denied to him? And, uh, you know, 
So there again, Hewlett Packard is a case of AAR, which has held that no, in such cases where it is genuinely otherwise allowable to him, merely because of shifting of tax residency, credit should not be denied. So that was another interesting issue. Then a uh, point came up before these decisions where whether foreign tax credit can be considered at withholding stage, you know, at the TDS stage. And it was held in favor in British gas, coromandel fertilizers, and Texas instruments, where the court said that, yes, it can be taken into account even at the withholding stage. Then is foreign tax credit eligible on the basis of income received or on the basis of gross receipts? So that means if suppose I'm receiving some income which is in the nature of business income, am I to, you know, firstly tax it on the basis of gross or on the income? Answer is clear, it should be the income. And then whether the foreign tax credit, because the TDS may have been deducted on gross basis, so whether I should claim credit on that basis or on the basis of income. Here again, it has been held very clearly that it should be on the basis of income. As I already said, elite core technology decision of Ahmedabad tribunal discusses how to in fact compute the allocation of expenses, et cetera, for the purpose of claiming credit. Then a hierarchy of tax credits, like what is the, the chronology in which I should claim tax credits? And here the Karnataka High Court in Sami Labs has held that first the credit should be given for the non-refundable taxes, which is 91, 90 mat, and then to the refundable taxes. So that again has been cleared by, it went up right up to the High Court for that matter. Now, these are questions which are, uh, there are not clear answers uh, even as of today. For example, how foreign tax credit would be available in case of fiscally transparent entities. Let me let me give you an example. Now, if suppose uh, we have a resident individual and this lady was a, a resident of US, a citizen of US, in fact, she is a citizen of US. She was a doctor practicing in US for a number of years, employed in US for a number of years. Now, for quite a few years, she has been a resident of India. Now, when she was in US, she has made investments in her retirement funds, as well as in number of investments in mutual fund type of funds, right? Now in USA, those retirement funds would be taxed only when she will retire or only when she achieves a particular age. And the other funds are, some of them are passed through funds. So which means whatever the fund earns is taxed in her hand in the US. For example, if the fund earns some capital gains, some could be short-term gains of the fund, some could be long-term gains of the fund as defined in USA. Some could be dividend income, interest income, or the same character of income she files in her US return in the same manner. And she pays the taxes in her individual hand. The fund don't pay tax. Now, when you come to compute Indian tax of this person, as well as the credit. Now, there's been a confusion as to whether, number one, whether at all in such cases, because she has not sold any of those units of those mutual funds. As far as retirement funds go, we have now a section 89 capital A read with rule 21 triple A, which I will come to. But as far as non-retirement funds go, uh, you know, there are two, there are two issues which arise. One is that under the Indian law, capital gains would arise only when she will sell or redeem any of those units, which she has not. Though those funds are passed through in USA, uh, as far as India is concerned, there is nothing to say that you have to tax whatever was taxed in USA in our hand. That's one theory. And so, so one option is we don't show any income of those of that type of a person from those funds till she actually sells or redeems some unit. That's one possibility. And so we don't claim credit for those taxes which she pays in US on that income. That's one possibility. Other interpretation could be that, uh, you know, I show all the income as far as her US return is there in the Indian return and claim full credit or claim credit for whatever tax she paid on that income. 
in the respective year itself and don't wait and as and when she will sell the or redeem the units i don't pay any tax on the ground that i already paid tax on the income as and when it was earned that's the second option now as far as you know the uh, the interpretation of the way the law is in my view the first seems to be the correct one that in india there is no tax till she actually redeems or sells those units and so no tax is payable no credit would be available but when you go to the practical aspect of it because if you try to do that and go and face the income tax department you know there is going to be total confusion because how are you going to take keep a track of such credits and such incomes as and when you know she will redeem and which year are you going to go back and claim credits etc it's going to be extremely difficult on a practical basis so on a very practical basis you know the income tax department basically asks you to match her us return with the indian return and show that all the income which is in the us has been shown in india so on a practical basis it becomes very convenient to show that income the only difficulty which arises is when there is capital gains short term long term of those funds you don't have the dates of sale or purchase by the funds so how are you going to fill the return form how are you going to put all those data and in absence of those data can the return be treated as defective etc so these are aspects which are not very clear uh, and in a practical course one generally tends to take a view which is a little more convenient then uh, what is really theoretical because it's extremely difficult to keep track of these type of because it's a amounts can be large and uh, you know it could be a number of years before she will actually sell or redeem anything and even if suppose she redeems some part in a particular year how are you going to compute you know the income relating to that then uh, the other is about self employment tax in usa there is something called self employment tax paid by a resident individual even if he is uh, you know uh, carrying on some sort of a you know i have a case where he is a director and fully employed and still he pays a self employment tax in my view this is something akin to a profession tax in it and no credit can be claimed for the same so the next Uh, segment uh, which i am uh, very quickly going to cover is this 89 capital a and rule 21 triple a introduced in our act basically they were introduced uh, in 2021 finance act and they they provide for uh, you know mismatch because as i said retirement funds in most of these countries would be taxed only in the year of withdrawal on from you know those funds and not Uh, on an accrual basis so there was a mismatch and so this basically section was introduced along with the rule and a form to allow the ssc to file it file that form and to claim a uh, an option to be taxed only at the time of withdrawal from such retirement funds so this is a benefit given to such cases where they are now residents and were earlier residents of foreign countries then article 5 of the mli uh, just to complete my subject uh, as you all all know in mli there was options india has selected option c that is credit method over the exemption method and these are the treaties which uh, are not affected by the mli indian treaties there is egypt bulgaria greece and slovak republic so to that extent because one of the other country may not have accepted that particular aspect so these treaties remain unaffected by the mli otherwise in other treaties india's would be the credit method and not the exemption method so this uh, I, i with this friends i think i have uh, concluded my presentation i have kept exactly 10 minutes time plus i'm ready to extend by some more time in case there are any questions i'll be really happy to take them over to you kush Oh, so at the moment there are no questions in the uh, in the question panel but yeah. in case anyone has any questions you can uh, just type them in now and uh, even if they wish to ask i'm fine yes so she i will ask yeah. one question yeah please uh, see india has the financial year as the year 
and yes. the taxation in the other countries may not be as a financial year but maybe calendar year july to june and so on so how do we calculate the ftc if the foreign country taxes it on a calendar year basis and india taxes on uh, the financial year basis yeah here again nilesh uh, the answer as per the law is that you have to go you have to compute income financial year wise that means from 1st april to 31st march so you will take the returns of uh, that country then proportionately or whichever way come to arrive at the figure for this particular financial year and corresponding credit that is the law but on a practical case let me tell you you know uh, because we tried doing that in a few cases of individuals and we found that we were almost breaking our head against the wall trying to explain the working on a practical basis when i consistently am following calendar years income when i am filing for indian financial year and i keep following consistently and i claim credit as per the us return i am finding things go very smoothly because i can show the return match the figures and the credit is given and there has been no questions till date asked though as i said very correctly it's not not as per the law as per the law i i would have to compute as per the financial year and claim the credit so i'm you know that is the law now uh, you know one could either follow the law or i i learned the hard way that following the law may not be the best method at times but then it is a challenge to it is always a challenge but these are you know you have to look at the practical challenges because otherwise you will never get credit because when you try to explain even at the higher levels very few are really aware of all these provisions when you are talking of individuals uh, you know who are residents of india you are going to the resident wards and not to the you know, international tax wards etc they are not really aware of all this and it becomes extremely challenging unless the government comes out with some clarity on the subject you know there are quite a few indian residents now who were non residents earlier who were us citizens or citizens of other country and they they have these issues all the time so so i think the government needs to be aware of this and try and make things uh, streamline situations i believe some questions may have come now because yes yeah, uh, sir i'll just uh, ask uh, say them out loud and then you can answer them uh, yeah. the first question is that uh, you've been requested to elaborate on how ftc can be taken uh, when tax is withheld on a gross receipt basis and income yeah. is taxed on a net yeah. basis yeah i i think i already answered this because ftc would generally be taken on gross basis on i mean ftc would be al always deducted on gross basis even in from in, when you look at india we deduct on the gross uh, dividends or interest or whatever but when it is taxed in the resident country it would be either taxed as a business income or if it is taxed as an interest income there could be a section 573 type of a situation where you could get some deductions so so it would be taxed on a net income so for example if you had 100 gross income but your taxable income in india is only 70 let's say on that particular source and the tax payable in india is 20 i'm just rounding off so on 70 you are paying 30, 20 uh, rupees tax while the tax which was deducted on 100 is let's say 30 so you will get credit only to the extent of 20 you will not get credit for the remaining 10 i i i hope i have answered this correctly yes sir and then so that uh, if you can answer what will happen to that 10 rupees which was lost Yeah. can it be deducted under section 37 that will answer the third question which is <laughs> yeah so 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 uh, you know honestly no uh, in my view no uh, you can't because this is a tax which is covered under the treaty and you cannot now say that to whatever extent i could not claim credit out of that i'm going to claim 10 i think that would be stretching the law a bit further but i cannot rule out some court agreeing to your view kush uh, you know it's, i cannot rule that out for you because the way the decisions i've explained uh, you know i cannot rule that out but the way i understand it uh, i honestly don't think you can claim for that 10 a deduction but uh, i'm sure there are nilesh already has his eyebrows up so maybe he has another view of the matter no i think uh, uh, claiming that 10 rupees is perhaps as i agree with you it is uh, stretching it too far i was just reading another question uh, in response to your example of uh, 70 kush uh, can you read the last one which has now been put up yes the question is that how to allocate the expenses to arrive at net income of say this 70 
Uh, can the HO expense also be allocated? No, as I said, as I said, for... this will go to a case specific issue. I, I, I am inviting your attention again and again to the decision of Ahmedabad Tribunal in Elite Core Technologies, where uh, Pramod Kumar Sahib has uh, de dealt with this aspect in detail about allocation of expenses. What can be allocated? What cannot be allocated? What is the basis of allocation for the purpose of credit only? So it's an extremely interesting and useful decision. Because you know, if you start discussing allocations of expenses, then then I think we are departing from the topic that we are at. Sir. So that is a you know every case would have a different uh, uh, working. Yeah. Yes, sir. So one question says that if an Indian company uh, declares dividend which is received from a foreign uh, foreign shareholding, and it claims ATM benefit. In this context, whether FTC credit will be available on the taxes paid on the dividend received. Although that income has been deducted by, by way of ATM. So, as I said, uh, you know, already uh, there are these judgments which I've referred to. Now, I'm assuming, like, if you are under 91, then it is only to the extent of doubly taxed income. Okay. Now, in this case, you know, 91 is slightly worse off because, uh, you know, but again, the courts have tried to say that when you talk of the word doubly taxed income, you don't have to take income in the tax act manner, but in the commercial sense manner. And so they have in fact allowed certain deductions, but controversial. But when you talk about the treaty, then uh, you know there is a slightly better case, uh, you know, where you could possibly try to claim even despite that ATM, the credit. But these are, that's what I have tried to point out the decisions, the decisions, Presently, you know, the high courts have taken favorable views on these matters. I'm not sure whether it will withstand the Supreme Court scrutiny. Uh, Wipro is in, before the Supreme Court, and so one waits how the courts are going to look at this. But the issue that you have raised is before the Supreme Court pending. So in, in case of ATM itself, uh, like how if a, the company will distribute, redistribute the dividend to its, uh, to its shareholders, and they will get, they will pay tax on that dividend. Should also the foreign tax credit similarly pass on to the shareholders and they should be allowed to take credit in their hands. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is, now you're talking of, uh, you know, an alternate plea being made, yes. saying that if you don't allow me this, then allow the shareholders. I, I do yes. not know, the law will evolve. Uh, you know, uh, as far as today, I think claiming deduction despite ATM is a possibility. But if for some reason that goes against, then then one has to try this alternate plea, but a bit difficult the way our law is. But there's never, you know, uh, never say never in our sure. law. And that is the fun of the whole thing. Yes, Sushil, uh, we saw the case of PwC and few others that yeah. the claim on, uh, means Form 67 can be filed later on also yeah. and the yeah. credit should be allowed. Yeah. And now Form 67 time limit also has been officially extended up to the end of the assessment year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in fact, before the amendment, I had a very peculiar case that on the last day of the filing of the return, my client was in the ICU and uh, uh, I, was, uh, I had to disturb his family that you please give me the OTP because without that, the uh, FTC would be lost. So this is one relief in such a case. But... The question is that what are the uh, avenues available to claim such a credit? Because you're with the faceless regime and the uh, now the returns are being processed very fast. So how do you, you will raise see, the, the way? No, if you the way the courts have said is that this rule is not a mandatory in nature. You know, if there is a credit which is legitimately available to you, nobody can deny it. That's the spirit of the agreed, decisions. Agreed, agreed. But and so, so, agree. so in a practical manner, like in faceless, also, even if there is a, uh, you know, uh, because they say even if no return, if no claim was made in the return, or even in the assessment stage, you could even make the claim in the appeal stage. So you are permitted to make that claim, is what the court is saying, and uh, uh, you know. Uh, so I, I believe you will have to follow that and try and claim it. So even if there is no uh, no issue, I file an appeal to keep the issue, uh, matter alive and then I, yeah. I additional claim, a, claim a additional ground. Yeah. I think it would have been better had the notification also said uh, that uh, it will get covered under 154 or 155. You can always represent, no? 
because yeah. you know this is not uh, in the act this is only a rule so mm-hmm. so you know there are number of case laws on interpretation of these rules that they are not really you know whether they are directory mandatory those type of situations where the courts here have said rule 128 is not mandatory as of today that's the line of uh, thinking of the courts okay i just want to ask to the end of uh, the so session one, so there's one more question okay take it up it says that if an indian llp is incorporated as a transparent entity uh, incorporates a transparent subsidiary in the us and is carrying on business in the us and this income is earned uh, in the us is taxed in the llp's hands in 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 the us and also in india so the in india will the uh, llp treat this as business income or as dividend income no the way there is some confusion in the question the way i understand uh if it is taxed in the hands of the llp in usa and it is the same llp which is getting taxed in india you know because what is to be taxed in india is the resident of india right now that llp is a us llp if the way the question is worded the llp is in usa or is it an indian llp earning in indian income? llp which has a subsidiary in the uh, a, tra- a transparent subsidiary in the us okay so the income is taxed in the hands of uh, and if the nature of the income see in in all transparent or uh, you know pass through cases the nature of the income would be the same as it was in the hands of the parent or whatever entity was there so for, so so i i see you know it will depend on what was the nature of the income in that hand it would be the same nature i believe Right. unless mentioned- unless the income is of a nature where the indian income tax act has some different uh, you know characterization let's say that that may be another reason to see by the way the mentioned- llp uh, yeah you mentioned while you were uh, during your presentation that it would be a good idea to then disclose de- declare this income from us to india and distribute it and show it as business income in the same year instead of waiting for distribution yeah. then probably they can take the same nature in, in india as well yeah but see in generally when we are talking of uh, you know a us llp or a us transparent entity the you, you know the individuals would be taxed in the us Correct. and claiming credit in india would be quite simple because yeah. the indian you know it's only in a case of this nature where there is an entity coming in between Correct. but i i believe they should be able to get credit yeah, yeah. no more questions Okay, so Sushil, I will uh, compliment you on a very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation of the tricky issues and which are uh, of very practical relevance. I will request Kush to uh, propose a very formal uh, vote of thanks. Yes, sir. So th- thank you, Sushil, sir, for wonderful session. Uh, all those the taxpayers may not get credit in some time, but full hundred percent credit to you. Thank you for enlightening us. Uh, and thank you for taking your time and answering all the questions much pleasure my uh, pleasure before we leave uh, some announcement for ifa members that the membership fees for 2023 are due before 20th of feb to 8 last end of this month so please do so to continue your membership and for non members uh, you are invited to try and take benefit of ifa membership and become members because more sessions like this are going to be held which would be f- uh, free of cost or subsidized cost for members and would be chargeable to non members so i invite non members to also apply for efa membership okay thank you good night thank everybody. you thank Have you everybody day. thank you so much bye bye